Hi, how are you? I'm great. So my question just has to do with I this um, COVID-19 uh, epidemic or pandemic has heightened my sense that I'm not where I should be in life. Um, and I think I coined a term in my, in my head. Um, it's the green grass trifecta. The grass <laughs> greener in the past, the grass should be greener now, and the grass might be better in the future, um, or it should be. Uh, so that's the way I'm feeling. I feel like that, uh, the constant rumination over this is just, causing me to get into that funk. And, um, you know, I have a schedule and I put those best practices forward to try to make myself feel great every day. So can you describe for me, what is it that you are ruminating about that makes you feel like that you're stuck in this green grass trifecta, as you call it? Well, I just, you know, everyone has started to lose their jobs. I know that Intellectually, I know that due to the pandemic, it does not discriminate against any sector of the economy. I mean, I just read an article that even healthcare workers, um, physicians assistants for like elective surgery, for example, and some doctors um, are being furloughed or losing their jobs. So I know it doesn't, it affects everyone. But just the idea that I could be on shaky ground and possibly lose my job um, if the company tries, you know, wants to make cutbacks. Um, you know, and it's mind boggling to me that these companies have such a short runway of one month and one month and then the entire economy goes to hell. Um, and so I know that it really may leave no person behind in terms of those effects. And so I wish I wasn't on such shaky ground and that that bothers me. So, so let me ask you a question though. So, so is the, the worrying that you're doing and the ruminating mostly about losing your job or are you beating yourself up and punishing yourself in other ways too? Um, it's about that, but I guess I am beating myself up and punishing myself for like not amassing massive amounts of wealth so that if I did lose my job, I'd just say, okay, well, who cares? I'm going to, you know, Bermuda and, you know, whatever. Um, so that bothers me. Are you where push the pandem pan pandemic or whatever the heck it's called aside, okay? Are you where you thought you would be in life by now? No, I think, um, you know, I went through the recession in 2008, which just it put, I would like make steps forward and take three steps back. So I would undertake a project to like improve my life and get, you know, where I wanted to go. And then something seems to always happen um, economically or just, I have some big loss in my life. And so it's just, it's the same thing here. I was starting to move forward and tried, I had a really good plan for where I wanted to be like a year from now. And I was implementing that plan and I had really great traction on that. And then boom, this thing happened. So okay. we are again. You know. Okay, so here's the opportunity for you. The opportunity for you is to not make the pandemic personal because the thing that will kill your ass is here we go again. When you start to buy into a narrative that there is a negative pattern in your life where you get fucked over, that just becomes louder and louder and louder. And what you're having right now is a crisis in your own resignation and you're seeing the pandemic as a gigantic reason for why it's never now gonna work out. And so what I want you to use this moment in time for is I want you to use this moment in time to start to truly win the battle with your own resignation. Because I used to have a story and sometimes it crops up when I get really pissed off about things. I used to have the story that I'm like the bad news bears. I'm like that little sports team that everybody underestimates and I never have the right equipment and I barely win by the seat of my pants and then everybody underestimates me and I never get the recognition that I deserve and why the hell does things have to be so fucking hard for me? And I'll tell you something, I thought I won that battle because I started to have some success. I, I've been working on my mindset. I've made a bazillion changes in my life. 
this is all when the five second rule book started to kick in. My speaking career takes off. I feel the momentum. Hell, I got a daytime syndicated talk show. I thought, holy shit, I have won the lottery. And all of a sudden, talk shows canceled. My book contract is canceled. Every single speech I have this year, but for one, is canceled. And I feel like I have been kicked back all the way to square one again. And every time I look on social media, everybody's a life coach and an expert in anxiety. And I'm like, what the fuck? You're a movie star. Get out of my lane. You know, like, when is it going to be my turn? You know, I, and this is coming from a person with millions of followers. And the reason why it surfaces up in a time like this is because I feel vulnerable. I feel insignificant. I feel scared. I feel powerless. And so that old story starts to bubble up again because it's familiar. And so the opportunity for me and for you is to use this pandemic to extinguish that shit. Because I'll tell you something, you are sitting in a house, you have a job, you have your health, you are a lucky son of a gun. And if you can get that shit out of your mind, you have the ability to use this moment of time to do what you need to do so that when we come out of this in search of a hug and some vitamin D, you are ready to sprint toward that thing. You have used this moment of time to think about, wow, all these goals that I have, the world's gonna be a little bit different, which creates way more opportunity for people that are positive and that are strategic. But if you and I allow our own rumination and our own bullshit story about the past to sabotage you right now and to take you down a dark tunnel, you will not only waste all of this time, but you will emerge from this moment with more evidence for why it's gonna be harder than ever. And I'm telling you right now, if you can get positive, if you can say bullshit, this is happening for a reason. And you know what? I am going to use this time to make my plan better. I'm going to use this time to think about the things that I wasn't thinking about. I'm going to use this time to think about the opportunities that may be waiting for me. And every time something pops into your mind, like, fuck, what if I lose my job? I don't have the savings. This house isn't as big as I wanted it to be. Shit, 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 shit. You're going off course. You are allowing things into your mind that, first of all, you don't need to worry about right now because it hasn't happened. Well, I even texted a friend of mine earlier and I was catastrophizing and I'm not really a catastrophizer. Um, Why are you doing it? Why? <laughs> I, said, I said, what if I need to go to a homeless shelter and the homeless shelters are overrun or the government cuts funding to the, <laughs> to the homeless but, but shelter? So why, but so why are you doing this? I don't know. I guess I was searching for... Uh, having a plan B and a plan C. Yeah. I think it's something deeper. I think you're seeking reassurance. I think you feel extremely vulnerable right now and you are seeking reassurance and your form of seeking reassurance is to get super dramatic right? So that everybody's like, oh, just calm down, calm down. How old were you when you started doing that? Um, I, I'm really not, as a habit, a catastrophizer. Um, I, but I did, as a young person, to get like my father to swoop in and comfort me or help me, I used to have to get very loud about it. So I crashed my car in freshman year of college, and it was a purpose. experience, and it took him days to call me. And then I said, Dad, and I had to cry and get louder. Um, this is what's happening. This I was, you know. This is it right here. This is the pattern that's repeating right here. You feel vulnerable. You want somebody to come in and rescue you because life feels fucking hard right now. And catastrophizing is a way to get people to reassure you. I know more about anxiety than most people on the planet because I struggled with it for 25 years and I also used it to manipulate the hell out of people. Not Interesting what you say about that. That's an interesting take. I've, I've heard you say that, um, that people with anxiety, they just get other people to fix their problems. Yeah. And it allows you to get out of having to do the work that scares you. Right. And what scares you right now is putting your head down because you had a plan and your plan was starting to work and now having to readjust the plan. Me too. I had a plan too. 
My plan was to be a daytime talk show host. It was to write another book and publish it at the end of the year. It was to do another 60 speeches this year. It was to launch another course. All that shit just went It scares the hell out of me to think about how am I gonna reinvent myself in this moment? And it's easier, it's easier to scroll through social media and be pissed off at people who look like they're ahead of you. It's easier to walk out of my office and walk into my husband's office and go, oh, what if this happens? And what if that happens? What if the other thing happens? And then he reassures me. All of which waste fucking time and energy. You have something you wanna do, what is it? Well, um, I wanted to move to Colorado and Fabulous. so, and I was making headway on that. Fabulous. No one's talking, you know, no more interviews, no more hiring, no more anything. So. Well, so what? You can't go anywhere anyway right now. Right. And so when this is over, guess what? Real estate prices are going to be awfully low. There are going to be a lot of places to rent. Right. There'll be plenty of things that you can figure out. If you lose your job, you could easily be unemployed in Massachusetts or in Colorado. Yeah. So there is nothing preventing you from moving to Colorado except for getting in your car and going when you can. Nothing has changed. You are just nervous because the plan that you had changed. Right. You can still get somewhere else. Life just told you it wasn't gonna work that way. And so life is testing you. How bad do you want it? Bad, badly. There you go. Then stop bitching about it. Stop texting your friends. Stop worrying about losing your job and start figuring out where the hell are you going to move exactly in Colorado and what are the companies you want to be targeting and who can you be networking with online and what kinds of things can you be doing in terms of stalking those folks in their comments and getting to know them online and doing all kinds of stuff to tee yourself up so that when this ends, you're ready to go. That's true. I should I should deepen my plan at this point. So I, it was working well just on the surface, like, oh, apply for this. These people would call me back and so on and so forth. But now I probably have to dig deeper. Yeah, um, you do. We all do, because this is not something that's happening to you personally. Look, we didn't choose for this to happen, but you get to choose how you show up to it. Right. And this is an opportunity for a huge breakthrough for you. Because you strike me as somebody who is very resigned and somebody who doesn't believe that shit's going to work out for her. I know, you know, and the truth is, if I go back historically, it has always worked out. Um, you know, I said, oh, I want to live here and do this and drive that car. And it's always worked. So I don't know. Why what don't you believe in yourself? I don't know, I'm gonna to have to think about that at this moment, why, or write down all the evidence for why I should, um, and go back in history and say, well, you did it this time and this time and this time and this time. And so that's evidence that-, um, that you The evidence do isn't convincing you because you're sitting here telling me about it in a very flat, unemotional way. You have a narrative that your life is hard. Right. And that it's not fair. And I don't know where that came from, but it's not serving you. And I would be willing to guess that it's either somebody else's story that you just started to adopt as your own, or it is something that you made up because of something that happened to you as a kid. Right. And as you have gone through life, surviving everything, and overcoming everything, the story that life is hard and it's not fair has remained. You see, life is just life. And you are the one that's deciding that it's not fair and it's hard. I want you to start telling yourself a different story. This shit's gonna get easy. I'm a problem solver. I'm a survivor. If anyone's gonna come out of COVID-19 and this bullshit, it's gonna be me because I'm going to be in a car driving to Colorado to meet up with all these people I've been networking with because my life is easy because I'm a doer and I believe in myself. That is your core issue is you are telling a narrative about your life, whether it's true or not, doesn't matter. What I know is it doesn't fucking serve you. And that's, what's got to change. 
Yeah, I've come, I've overcome a lot of obstacles, um, but and they were all kind of unfortunate events that I couldn't control as a kid and moving along. Even though I had, I had a wonderful childhood, um, but there have been obstacles, and so I do feel like in many ways I'm like a survivor instead of just thriving. I'm surviving, um, and that's not, you know, you're right. I need what to. What does it mean to thrive in your mind? To. to for everything to come not easily like oh here come give it to me and, and you know slap it on my lap but um for me to say this is what i really want to do and then the steps move along and things happen and they come through in a positive way and i i get what i want in an e relatively easily instead of having such a struggle well what if you're the only part of the struggle what if you're the one and I'm not talking about a struggle out there. I'm talking about the struggle in here. I'm looking for a little, oh, here it is, hold on. I've been using this a, a lot. Is this one? I don't know. This will work. It's a, I've got a, another word on this, but oh, here it is. Let me see. So there's, oh, is this going the right way? Can you see this? External, internal? Um, there's external struggle and internal struggle. This is the struggle that needs to end. Right. Thriving would mean not getting all that stuff. Thriving would mean that you are doing what you're doing without punching yourself mentally and emotionally the entire time you're doing it. Right, removing the resistance. It's almost like when they're doing a roof and there's tar on the street and you drive over it and it just tacks on to your to your yeah. time. Same thing, you just have to get rid of that because. Here, here's the thing that has changed my life and always diffuses the bullshit stuff that I tell myself about being the bad news bears, you ready? The thing that I'm in right now is preparing me for the chapter I can't see that's coming. And when I look at my life that way, I don't see anything as a failure. Yeah, of course, I just told you a story that my talk show got canceled and my book got canceled and my speeches got canceled. That's just what happened. I can either tell myself a story that all that shit got canceled because I'm a fucking loser, or I can tell myself a different story, which is all that stuff got canceled because it was supposed to. I wasn't supposed to do that talk show. I was supposed to learn something doing it. I was supposed to meet people doing it. I was supposed to gain some sort of skill doing it that is preparing me for the next thing that's amazing that I can't see. And that's already coming true because that's been the story of my life if I really want to tell it in a positive spin. Of course the book was supposed to get canceled because that publisher was a pain in the ass to deal with. And I was a year late in delivering a manuscript. I wonder why because I wasn't all that inspired to write it. So it prepared me for never doing a deal again that didn't quite feel right. Thank God it got canceled. Right. And speeches yeah. getting canceled, it's now blowing my mind. Of course I lost a shitload of revenue, but you know what? It's making me think about the fact that the whole world has changed and there's so much opportunity in doing training and events virtually. And now, like, how can I problem solve in that? And so there is something in what's happening in the struggle that is meant for you. And when you flip it into a faith that is preparing you for something and the biggest possible thing that you're supposed to learn is how not to suffer internally and how not to struggle internally. And when I say suffer and struggle, I don't mean the daily bullshit and the emotions that rise and fall that happens to all of us. Of course you see something on Instagram or social media and it triggers you and it makes you feel inferior. Let it last for 10 seconds and then keep going because you have a faith and a bigger belief that something amazing is coming. And this mental battle that you gotta learn how to win, you're not gonna get the reward that you're supposed to get until you learn how to stop struggling and how to stop adding all of that tar that you talk about. And it comes, what's that? Is it one hundred percent? And that's why I was saying about going back. And if I if I just journaled it or something, and I said, "Look, this is what what got me to where I am now," and I could see every step of the way, then writing that down would get it in my head, which will get it into my heart, 
that um, the yes. The, you can do that, and that is one thing to start to do to reprogram the story you tell about your life. The second thing I have is a tolerance policy for allowing that shit to stay there. And I would, I would use the five-second rule, count down backwards to yourself. The moment you start getting one of those negative thoughts, I do not do this anymore. I am going to live in a mindset that things are unfolding and I don't even know how or what or why yet. I just know I'm not allowed to struggle anymore. I'm supposed to remind myself that I survived this stuff and it's time to start thriving and being patient and trusting through this instead of being so mm, about it all. That's how I am. I need to stop. You know why I know? Because it's how I am. And if I let myself get stuck up here, I become this tense ball of frustration. And the second I start to feel that in my body, that is an old fucking story. Get it out of here. I do not believe that anymore. I believe that if I, if I do the work and if I keep in a space in my head and in my mind and my body, that this is unfolding in a way that I cannot see, but it is preparing me for something amazing that's coming. You stay in that space of gratitude. You stay in that space of faith. You stay in that space and you will win every single time. There was this one morning where um, I walked into the bathroom and I was standing in my underwear, brushing my teeth in front of the mirror. And I looked up at the mirror and my first thought was, ugh, I noticed that my jowls were starting to look like saddlebags on a pack horse at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and uh, I had like these crazy lines by my eyes and my neck was really like kind of saggy and one boob was hanging lower than the other and my gray hair was coming in. And, I, and as soon as I started kind of critiquing my thoughts or my, my looks and appearance, then my mind, Rich, started going, fuck, I didn't get that email back to that person. And I got that presentation I need to do. And my God, did that speech just cancel again? What the fuck am I going to do? And I look down and the dog needs to be walked. And then I think, I, I got a Zoom call in nine minutes. Like, I got to get my shit. Again. And before I knew it, my whole mood was low. I felt overwhelmed. I had taken myself down mentally. I just wanted somebody to walk in and be like, Mel, you got, it's going to be okay. Like you got this girl, like mm -hmm. it's lift your head up. You can handle this. I don't know what came over me, Rich. This is pathetic. But standing there in my underwear in front of my bathroom sink, I raise my hand and high five my reflection. And I cracked a smile because it's so fucking corny. I even thought of that guy, Stuart Smiley from the SNL skits. Mm -hmm. Remember that I'm nice, I'm kind, yeah. people like me. Went on with my day. That was it. Snapped a photo though. No, not that one. Oh, not that one. Mm -mm. Not the first time. And then I kept doing it. I did it probably for a week or two. And here's the weird thing about it. I started when I woke up after doing this high five your own reflection in the mirror thing. I actually started to feel like I was looking forward to it. And here's why. You know, I've spent a lifetime, just like you, standing in front of the mirror. And what I realize now is that when I'm standing in front of a mirror, I'm either critiquing mm -hmm. or picking myself apart or I'm ignoring myself. And when you start to high five your own reflection, it starts to build a partnership within you, with yourself. When you walk into the bathroom, and you see your reflection and you've been greeting it, it's like seeing another person. It's the strangest thing. You start to realize how often you fucking ignore or destroy yourself when you see yourself or beat yourself up. And here's what's also crazy. You have a lifetime positive association with high-fiving other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. As a runner, as a racer, you have gotten so many high-fives, Rich. What does a high-five say to you when somebody gives you one? You feel seen, you feel appreciated, you feel energized by it. And it's, a, it's an exchange of energy. It's not the same, and you talk about this in the book, it's not the same as like self-talk because it, there's a participation involved in it. There's like a communion yes. aspect to it. Yeah. And you know, if you think about it, you're so good 
at celebrating, seeing, and cheering for other people in your life. You plan birthday parties, you reach out to people when you're worried about them, you help out colleagues, you cheer for your favorite sports teams, you high five people like Rich as they're running races past you, you buy people's merchandise, you do all kinds of stuff for other people, but nobody's taught you how to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why it feels f***ing weird to high five your own reflection is because you've been taught to do the opposite. Why is the default to just beat ourselves down like that. I mean, it is crazy. We would never treat anyone else in our lives, especially the people we care about, the way that we treat ourselves in terms of the self-talk or the narrative or the critique or the, you know, the, the, the kind of harshness with which we, you know, judge our appearances, our behavior, the way we, you know, think back on things that we said the other day and just are horrified by our own selves. And it's, I don't know if it's everybody, but everybody, it's most people, except for Buddhists. I mean, I yeah. think that they're like, like if you're a big practicing Buddhist, that's a monk, right? That's like just why kind can't of... the default be the good things, though? Well, you I know why yeah, is it wired? You know that why? Way? There's a there's cognitive bias. There's a there's a bias towards mm -hmm. negativity, uh, and it's a protection mechanism. That's a default from evolution. That if you remember the bad, shit, you're more likely to spot it when it happens in right. the future, so you can avoid it. And here's where I think it begins. I believe my theory is that it begins two places. Either you, or that could be both actually, you either learned the pattern of beating yourself up because you had parents or caregivers that were hard on themselves or hard on you. And so as a child, you absorb that pattern and you now repeat it and you don't even realize it. So those moments you're like, oh my God, I sound just like my dad or my mom. That is an example of a pattern that you've absorbed. Mm -hmm. So particularly for women, We've watched our mothers be critical about their appearance. We've watched our mothers ignore and criticize themselves in the mirror. And so we learn that from our caregivers. So that's one place. The second place that we learn it is when the drive in your life becomes fitting in. Fitting into groups in elementary, middle, high school, college, your neighborhood, that feels safe when you fit in. When you feel like you don't belong, you immediately go into a protection mechanism. And I believe a lot of the negative self-talk is a sorting hat type of mentality yeah. that we do to ourselves going, I can't be with those people. I can't be with those people. It's safe to be with those people. And you start to see yourself and the world around you as places where you belong and places where you don't. And part of the criticism, as fucked up as it sounds, that we engage in all the time is don't be too big, don't be too loud. Don't show yourself too much. Don't have blue hair. Don't do this. Other people won't like you. It starts as a way to protect yourself from mm -hmm. being rejected. But the truth is you develop a habit of rejecting yourself. Right. Meanwhile, you're further divorcing yourself from who you truly are because you're not Correct. giving yourself permission to be yourself. That gets sublimated in favor of fitting in and you know accommodating other people and acclimating your behavior around what will be approved of. Yes. So for me, um, I, you know, I have clearly a lifetime of beating myself up and tearing myself down and regretting decisions that I made. And in the middle of stumbling through life, instead of being like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Being like, you're really fucked up now, Mel. How does that help? Right. How does criticizing and, and being hard on yourself help? I love how you weave in the science throughout the book. We become a self-validating machine. Totally. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, kind of what you've learned in terms of how we keep ourselves locked in. Oh, in these this cycles. is incredible. It's incredible. So the, so the morning that I discovered this thing, um, I'll kind of unpack this because the, the, the first morning and the second morning, I know that you're going to take this like, boom, even deeper. So here we go, everybody buckle up. So it's April, 2020. And, you know, I can't use my normal coping mechanisms. We're all in quarantine. So as I yes. lose my dream job and my kids' college experience implode and they're grieving and upset and sad and I'm terrified for my, I'm, you know, scared for everybody and the frontline workers and life is upside down and the anxiety starts to kind of roll back in. I can't run to Target. I can't go to the coffee shop. I can't distract myself by running to do a speech. I can't go see my friends. All of the busyness, by the way, which I now can see was a form of self-regulating stress and trauma. 
that if I'm on the run, I don't have to deal with the woman in the mirror. If I'm moving and the adrenaline is pumping, I don't actually have to sit and be with myself. Maybe I can just outrun this stuff. And so I, and even the genesis of the five second rule, the genesis was if I move fast enough, if I launch myself out of that bed, maybe I won't be there when the anxiety hits. So even that was like right. a, a perfect right. illustration of just push through it, don't deal with it. Okay. It's a fast thing that has profound effect, but it doesn't hit the source of what's causing all of the hatred and the tension and the pain in the first place. So I get out of bed, five, four, three, two, one. I make my bed that morning so I don't crawl back into it. I feel exhausted, overwhelmed. We've all felt this before, whether you felt it during the pandemic or you felt it because you lost a job or somebody just says, I don't love you anymore, or you hate how you look. We've all felt this. I'm overwhelmed by my life. I'm exhausted. I can't face this. I get into the bathroom. I start brushing my teeth. And... I immediately catch a glimpse of myself and I think, oh my God, you look like hell. And then the habit starts that I really want us to unpack because every single human being I'm discovering has a habit that is so destructive and none of us are talking about because it's so subtle and it is so hard baked into your mind. And it's this, every morning in the bathroom mirror, you either ignore yourself, which is a form of rejection, or you pick yourself apart and see all the things you need to fix or what you don't like. And this isn't, you know, this is everybody. 50% of people are uncomfortable or will not look at themselves in the mirror. I'll admit, I raised my hand took me a very long time to really, truly, and there's still discomfort there of looking at myself. And I used to tell myself, well, it's okay. I know how I feel in my body and that's my marker. I feel good today and that's all I need. I don't need to look at that mirror. Not really understanding that I was in that act of avoidance. Something felt very intimate, very vulnerable. Um, before I even got to then the criticism of myself, it just was for me pure avoidance. I didn't really care. I mean, I would need mirrors if I maybe put some makeup on. And outside of that, me and mirrors, I didn't really, I didn't have a relationship with them at all. Not knowing, again, I told myself the story of why I believed I wasn't looking at them until I dove down and unpacked it and understood that there was a discomfort there and still, like I said, remains for me. Well, same for me. So I start picking myself apart. I feel my energy going down. And, you know, the interesting thing, as I felt myself just getting so defeated, why'd you get up late? You haven't texted Nicole back. The dog's not walked. Like, I'm just like dragging. And you know all the research around emotional contagion. So do I. You know that this emotion and negative space is going to impact your productivity. And like, we know all this, but it's a habit. I've been doing this for four decades is how long I've been doing this as part of my morning routine. And so if you had walked in the bathroom that morning, I would have spun on a dime. I would have been like, Nicole, I know this is terrible. I'm so sorry you're going through this. You don't deserve this. But if anybody can face this, you can. What do you need? How like, I would have lifted you up. Mm -hmm. I could not think of a thing to say. And here's the thing. I wouldn't have even believed it because it didn't match how I was feeling. And I don't know what came over. I honestly believe it was the universe, the divine source saying, all right, we're ready for this. Because it is so cheesy on its face. <laughs> I'm literally in my underwear, alone with the dog at my feet, literally having the dark night of the soul. And I lift my hand to my tired reflection because the woman in the mirror needed a high five. And in that moment, lightning didn't strike. It wasn't like the heavens opened and, you know, purple light came in and whoa, that's not what happened. You know, as you know, too, like you kind of have this awakening and then it's like, now what? <laughs> uh, no, but I felt this like shift and I can explain the science. It's crazy. I felt this shift and the energy wasn't lovely. The energy was more like, oh, come on. You know, I laugh. Oh, come, Mel, come on. It's like, get out there. 
you know, you're safe, you're fine. Like, I kind of shoved myself. I didn't even think, mm -hmm. like, I didn't say it. It was a shift. But N Nicole, holy cow, the second morning, the second morning, this is when my healing took a quantum leap. Like, I can't even wait till you guys hear this. Like, I cannot wait for everybody to experience this. I wake up, same overwhelm, same just defeated, down, tired, anxious, stressed, alone. And I, uh, five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. I make the bed. I start walking to the bathroom. And I realize I am feeling something. I don't think I'd ever felt in my entire adult life. And it was this. You know how when you're about to walk into a cafe and you're going to see somebody you just love, you like them so much, you're about to walk in. What do you feel? I mean, anything from, you know, excitement to even that warm love, I think that you are expecting to go and receive in that moment. Yeah. I actually felt that about seeing myself. How powerful. I um, had never felt that as an adult. I'd been excited to see an outfit or what my hair looked like, but I had never felt that sense of joy or excitement about seeing the human being, Mel Robbins. Being. The being, right? Because I'm thinking too, I'm like, what? Like I just went down a trip of what have I felt excited about? And if I were to categorize, it was the stuff I was doing, I would say, or the, you know, or even an event, it didn't have to even be an accomplishment. You know, as I began to heal, as I began to shift a little less into, I have to achieve things. It would just still be an exciting experience I had planned coming up. And I I'm having a really hard time having consistent or frequent memories of just me being enough. And for me, you know, if I map it on back into childhood, one of my major copings too was that doing was shifting from right a little girl self-expressing in whatever way to there were things that I was, it was very clear I was good at very early on. And so for me, that shift into doing and then the excitement, the warm feelings, even the loving connection, I could even go as far to say that my doingness, my achievements, my like how I was in the world actually for me for a long time was point of connections for me in my family mm -hmm. relationships, in my friendships. How can I serve you? How can I show up for you? Friend, partner, whomever. And so for me, it's hard to think of moments where I felt enough, excited, warm about me without action, uncloaked, just raw in a mirror. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. And it goes back to something you said earlier. You also tend to get a lot of positive, uh, you know, emotion and praise when you're achieving those things. At least I did too. And I think that's why I chased it so much. I infused mm -hmm. the doing with being lovable, the achieving with being worthy. And so as I walk into the bathroom that second morning and the sort of profound nature of what was unfolding started to hit me, I have this second epiphany as I'm brushing my teeth. And that is this, every morning, there are two people in the bathroom. There's you, and there's a human being in the mirror who needs you. They are trying so hard. They are waiting for you to wake up and to realize that they're there. They need your encouragement. They need your support. They need your love. They are so tired of you picking them apart and thinking about all the things that are going wrong. And as I put my toothbrush down, I remembered the fact that yesterday, the day before, I had been researching, how do I need to change right now because I have all these people on my team? How am I gonna show up for my family? And I found this piece of research from Harvard that says that if you take just a, less than a minute of intentional reflection about how you're gonna show up for the people that you're leading, and this could apply to your family, anybody. It changes your focus, your productivity. It changes your mood. It changes how you show up, your ability to impact. And for whatever reason, in that moment, it all fused together. And I thought, well, what if I do that for me? And I asked myself a question I had never asked myself before. And it was this. 
who do you need me to be today? Like I asked the woman in the mirror, who do you need me to be today? How can I show up for you? And, you know, what kind of popped into my mind that morning was like, well, it'd be nice if you were kinder to me because I'm trying really hard. <laughs> and then the next one was, it'd be great if you could muster up some optimism here. Have a fun today. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, hell, throw me a lifeline, Mel. And as I thought about it, I then went and I raised my hand and I sealed it with this high five. And something like it just felt like this fusion with the person in the mirror. And that's when I really got it. I got that this is so much deeper and more profound because what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm fulfilling my fundamental emotional needs. I'm seeing myself. I am meeting myself where I am. I am affirming my unique need and I am celebrating myself exactly where I am right now, whether it's challenging, whether it's exhilarating. I am with myself right in that moment in a way that I don't know if I had ever been. I think it's really, you know, pivotal. And I want, you know, I want to reiterate this because I think it's such a great point of understanding back to that onion analogy again, when you said there's two people, right? And I could go as far to say that so many of us have different masks, different selves, right? The core, like we were just talking about, is who we really are. Mm -hmm. Though so many times in our day to day, we are showing up in all of these different ways, playing all of these different roles. And there is an us that we need to, and the journey becomes about connecting back to. So a lot of us are kind of at odds with even ourselves in so many moments because we're so practiced. At, sh at showing up in all of these other ways that we've lost so much sight of the authentic core within each of us. And what you're also illustrating, I think that's so important, is the daily, the practice of that reconnection, right? And many of us start by not knowing, not seeing ourselves, not knowing what there is even to see or to self-express. For me, I share this story often. I had a really, when I came to the awareness that I, like you and like many of us, filter the whole world through everyone else and what their needs may be. I had a big gaping hole of knowledge. I didn't know myself. I didn't really know that person in the mirror. I did know that we do, I believe, as humans universally. I don't care where you're signing onto this live right now around the globe. We have at our core the desire to be seen, to be heard, to be just in full self-expression and that, for that to be enough. Yet I didn't know who that person was. So I, I share this because I do want to speak to the people who, as we begin to look in the mirror, and for a lot of us, it might just be a concept. Okay, there's an authentic self in there where I don't know where that person is. I don't know what that person needs yet. And that's when we begin the journey to explore. Because I, like many of us, didn't know at first, was profoundly uncomfortable with even beginning to ask those questions. What do I need right now? Can I just be enough in this moment? And it is the question that sets us off into the journey. And I share that because I know a lot of us, we want to know the answers or we think we should. And then we shame ourselves out of even taking the journey into exploring those. But for me, I'll share, that's how my journey began. Not knowing at all with incredible discomfort, even around stopping to even ask myself those questions. And of course, like you said, it does not happen overnight. I say there's no light switch here. Oh, I heal now. Um, and again, I want to <laughs> highlight the practice of it, right? Because there's concepts, there's books, there's, you know, people and teachers and tools and techniques, and they're all in theory until, like I say, we bridge the gap from theory into action. And that's what I've always resonated so much with your work um, from the five second, five second, well, this idea of the tool. How do right. I practically apply right. this? And now, of course, the high five habit. How do I turn this idea? into a daily action that can actually help me create the change that I'm looking for to a reconnect yes. with that person beneath and B to over time, grow to love them over time, grow to love them. But what do you think are the reasons we doubt ourselves or what do you think is the steps to gaining more confidence in ourselves when we doubt? Um, so I always thought that confidence, uh, 
was a thing that you feel. And I have come to prefer that confidence is something that you do, meaning that you know a, a lot of people a lot of people like to to think, okay, well, you're going to feel confident first, and then once you feel confident, then you'll take the action. And that's wrong. It's not a chicken or an egg in my mind. I think what happens is you have to force yourself in a moment of self-doubt to do something. And when you see yourself taking action, the confidence mm. follows. Mm. So I have created my own definition of confidence, which is confidence is the willingness to try. And you display the willingness to try when you take action. Yeah. It's a lot like the relationship between courage and fear. You can't have courage without fear. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's acting in the face of it. And confidence isn't the absence of self-doubt. It's being willing to try even though you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's going in the book. I'm quoting you in the book. Make it, baby. Make it your own. I love that. That's powerful. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I'm sure you probably, we're very similar in the sense that we do a lot and we build confidence because we would take action. You in law school and, and public defending and all these different things you've done, which like, okay, I'm afraid, but let me go do it and do it. And now, okay, I'm getting better. Now I feel more confident. It's not yes. just, it's not just let me learn something or let me, read a book and now I'm confident in a skill that I haven't applied, I must apply it and fail a bunch and yes. realize, oh, okay, I've gotten better. I have fallen over and over and now I'm standing and I'm actually doing okay and I'm doing even better now. Let me build my confidence there, so. Yes, and look, you know, here's the thing. I think that preparation and studying something so that you feel like you have an understanding of something can be an important first thing that you try, mm -hmm. but don't let the studying of something become the reason why you don't actually take the next action. Yeah. Well, I need to get my master's. I need to go to business school. I need to go to whatever, and then never actually do it. When you can yes. start doing something much sooner before needing to have all the credentials necessarily. Yes, there's very few things. Except for like being a doctor. Okay, maybe don't do surgery. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a chemist, a doctor, something that requires you to actually have accreditation course, and specialized knowledge, an engineer, whatever. But most things that you will master in life will not be mastered by reading a book. You cannot mm -hmm. learn how to ride a bike by reading about it. You have to get your ass on that seat and, and find your balance. <laughs> yeah. That's how you find balance That's is it. by falling because balance is somewhere in between not being on the bike and falling. Mm -hmm. or being on the bike and falling rather. That's beautiful. So let's talk about loving you, you, the you of you and how that yeah. is such a diversion from what you've been practicing doing yourself. Oh, that's so true. Oh my God. You know, it's so funny because here I invent this thing called the five second rule out of dumb luck, drunk on bourbon. I literally <laughs> share it by mistake on a TEDx stage. And I invented this thing to help me get out of bed during the worst moment of my life and finally face the issues that my husband and I had, had gotten ourselves into. It spreads around the world. I use the five second rule to build a business, to be productive, to you know do, 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 do. But it wasn't until I discovered the high five habit that I actually understood how deeply I had been betting against myself, mm -hmm. how every step of the way I had been criticizing myself or focusing on what was going wrong, that when I stood in front of the mirror, Kathy, I did not see a successful woman. I did not see somebody that was, you know, out there making a huge difference. I saw what was wrong with me. I think for the first, for the last 45 years, I have either criticized or ignored the woman I saw staring back with me in the mirror. And so like the high five habit, I'm sorry, I, I, I just kept barging along. Is there something you wanted to? No, I'm just taking it in. You're right where you need to be, keep going. And so, you know, the high five habit, it did not begin 
like some big business strategy. I didn't go, okay, I had the five second rule. I need to write a book about the five something. What is it? Like, let's, let's manufacture something. Oh, atomic habits is good. Let's get a habit book. Like that's not what happened. Cause that's not my brand of self-help. My brand of personal development and empowerment is hit rock bottom, have a challenging moment, resist change, and then come up with something that sounds so stupid and so ridiculous that it couldn't possibly be something that would actually work. And then when it actually starts working, not only for you, but people who follow you, you better fucking figure out how this thing works. Matt. Like, why is this working? And so the, the high five habits, no different. I have been trying to write a book, Kathy, for five years. The, the five second rule was self-published five years ago. I have dyslexia and ADHD. I can create an audio book like in a day. Yeah. Writing something, forget oh, about it. I bet I have written seven books in the last five years. Yeah. All of them sucked. And what happened for me, this is not a pandemic book, but what happened for me, because we're all sick of hearing about the pandemic, but what happened for me is, you know, when the COVID hit, we all have that moment. Like, I'm sure you remember the moment you knew, oh my God, like this is changing everything. Yeah. What was it for you? When they said two weeks, the kids would be off school. And then they said, no, it's going to be a month. And I had that feeling of like things closing in and the claustrophobia, like, how will I be able to exist now with, with us not being able to go out to even a park? What if this would stay this way? Yeah, it was right then. I couldn't believe they were like closing school. Yeah. Months. Yeah. For me, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a Wednesday in March in uh, 2020. And we were taping uh, this talk show. It was my dream to be a daytime talk show host. And at the age of 51, I got the opportunity to do it. And so we had shot 167 shows at the CBS Broadcast Center. And all of a sudden, somebody comes into the studio space and says they found COVID in the building and you need to evacuate. You got to be out of here in five minutes. The fire trucks are outside. Mm -hmm. And like that, show canceled, fired from my dream job, didn't get to say goodbye to the 130 people that I had been working with for over a year. That is I so painful. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, everything is preparing you for something everything. And so I get into my car and I'm driving home and I realized as the New York city skyline was, was, was disappearing. And my daughter was in Spain and she called and said, I just heard the news that they're shutting down the borders. I need to get a, like, I, you got to get me out of here. And then I hung up with her and all of a sudden it was my daughter in California. USC is shutting down, mom. What is it? What's happening? What, what's going on? And I thought, oh my God, what is about to happen? And so in a matter of two weeks, my uh, a book contract that I had got canceled and they wanted the money back. My every speech I had booked for more than a year yeah. started canceling. And that was the beginning. The kids come home, they're in a state of turmoil. We all experienced it, right? And I think for those first three weeks, it was like a complete blur. I, I basically never got out of my pajamas. I started drinking Bloody Marys at about 11 a.m. We watched Harry Potter marathons and Glee. We watched that season, like all of it. And then all of a sudden, one morning, I woke up. And I just felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. Yeah. I woke up and I started feeling a couple things. I felt, am I, a, do I need to reinvent myself? again? Oh my God. And then I thought, am I about to lose all my money again? And I'm like, I'm too old for this shit. I've worked too hard. Like you go into that like mode where like, why is this happening to me? I I'm a good person. I've worked so hard. Like you like kind of go yeah. at yourself. And so I'm thinking this and I'm like, okay, get up, just get up five, four, three, two, one. I get up. I make my bed. I always make my bed. And then I drag myself to the bathroom and I start brushing my teeth. And as I'm brushing my teeth, Kathy, I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And I think, oh my God, you look like hell. And the gray hair is coming in and there's dark circles under my eyes and my neck is all saggy and one boob is hanging lower than the other. And I'm literally... I felt sorry for the woman I saw in the mirror. She looked 
exhausted. She looked scared. She looked overwhelmed. And as soon as you start to go down a negative path in your mind, it will continue taking you there. And so I immediately drift to everything I'm worried about. I'm worried about my parents. I'm worried about the world. I'm worried about frontline workers. I'm worried about COVID. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my employees. I'm worried about what's going to happen to my business. I'm worried about everything. And the interesting thing in that moment is if you had walked in, I would have been able to pivot on a dime, especially we women. That's what we do. I would have been like, Kathy, Kathy, don't you dare. Don't you dare. I know this isn't fair. I know you don't deserve. If anybody can handle this, Kathy, you can. You're going to pick your ass up. You're going to pull on your big girl panties and you are going to get your (laughs) ass back out there, right? You could do that for anybody else. But there I was without a bra on my attitude in the gutter overwhelmed by my life, stressed out, no energy, last on my list, Mm -hmm. an impossible amount of shit to deal with, just defeated. And I couldn't think of a damn thing to say to myself. And you know, the other thing is I probably wouldn't have believed it anyway. Right. But for whatever reason, as cheesy as it sounds, I literally raised my hand and gave the woman I saw in a mirror a high five because she needed it. And, you know, it wasn't like lightning struck, but something shifted in me. You know, I felt my shoulders drop. I felt my chin lift. I laughed because it's so dumb standing there, high-fiving yourself in your underwear. My God. And it's interesting because I also felt like, okay, you know, come on now, Mel. Don't be so dramatic. You can handle this. And I left the bathroom. Now, it was the second morning that something really clicked with me because I woke up again, all the same problems, all the same overwhelm, five, four, three, two, one. I get out of bed. I make the bed. I drag myself into the bathroom. And right as I was getting to the bathroom, that's when I felt something I've actually never felt before in my entire life. And that is this. You know, when you are about to go see somebody you really like, And you're going to meet him for a cup of coffee or like a, you know, like a glass of wine or whatever. And you're about to enter the cafe. What do you feel, Kathy, as you're about to see somebody you like? You're excited and there's like this anticipation. And so you're already feeling good vibes because you know what that person's like and being in their energy. Yeah, totally. That's exactly how I felt sitting in your Zoom room. Like, let me in, Kathy. Let's go. Come on. I can't (laughs) wait to see you and meet you. Um, I actually felt that about seeing myself. I have never felt that in my entire life. I have never been excited to see the human being Mel Robbins. I have been excited to see my outfit. I've been excited to see if the eyeshadow looks good. I have never looked forward to seeing myself, the human. And so I walk in and I'm a little bit more present this morning and I'm brushing my teeth and I put my toothbrush down and I take a moment and I really look at myself and I don't even see my face. I see a human being. What's coming up for you? I mean, that's just so beautiful. Like what you just said, we think about that when we're about to go see our friend or, you know, the other mom who her daughter's in your daughter's class. And there's like an excitement. Like you feel like this is like a gift to spend time with this person, but you had never thought about that. And I just think about the women and the men who I've, I've met in my life, the people who listen to this show, who they're so good Mel, and they're so wired to achieve but they're only as good as like their last achievement. Mm. So there is nothing other than like, well, what's my big post today on Facebook for everyone to see that I earned it. I earned it today, but like inherently like me just being me. No, I've never heard anyone say like, 
what a gift to get to be in that person's energy, my own energy today with myself to see myself. Yeah. It's, it's everything. And so, you know, I, I sat and I, and I looked at the woman I saw in the mirror and I thought to myself, well, who does she need me to be today? And what game in life matters to her? And how could I actually just like move the ball down the field today? And so I thought about it. And I thought in that moment, based on what was going on, that who she needed me to be was more optimistic about our ability to get through this. And the game that I wanted to play was showing up in a different way for our kids because they were looking at Chris and I about what was happening in the world. Yeah. And so I raised my hand and I like high five my reflection. And so there's a couple things that I just want to explain first about when, you know, you do this because the beauty of this habit, and this is just the first habit in the book, and we're going to talk about it. And trust me, we are going to get down to the achievement stuff <laughs> next because it's 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 really important part of why everybody resists high-fiving themselves and why they feel that it's weird. And I'm going to unpack that in a very methodical way because thematically, when you feel that this is weird or you resist giving yourself this support and celebration, what's contained in the resistance is the key to understanding why you don't have what you want. And it's also the key to unlocking the cage that you're trapped in. Oh, that's so juicy. In this video, I'm gonna show you the specific way that you can use the five second rule to stop doubting yourself and worrying so much. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, just think positive or meh, try not to worry. It sounds simple, but it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is because it doesn't work. And actually research shows that when you try to ignore your worries, it can actually make them worse. Look, I understand this topic more than most people because I struggled for decades, not only with worrying and self-doubt, I actually suffered from anxiety and panic attacks for almost 25 years. And in fact, I took Zoloft for two decades to control my anxiety. Using the five second rule, I've not only been able to stop worrying and doubting myself, I've cured myself of anxiety and I've been off meds for more than four years. I'm panic attack free and I almost never ever worrying about anything. And you can teach yourself to do the exact same thing using the rule. First, here's what I want you to know. You're not a worrier. A lot of us call ourselves a worrier, right? Oh, I'm a worrier. You're not a worrier. You have a habit of worrying. That's a very big difference. You've allowed your mind to drift and linger on negative thoughts so many times. It's now a pattern of behavior that you repeat and you don't even realize it. And that's actually good news because that means that you and I can use the science of habits to break the habit of worrying and the habit of doubting yourself. In the language of habit research, the five second rule is what psychologists call a starting ritual. It's, it's a tool that you can use that will interrupt the negative thought patterns that are encoded in your brain as habits and trigger positive new thought and behavior patterns. The five second rule is shockingly effective because it works with all the latest research about habits. What I've learned using the five second rule is that I do in fact have control over what I think. And when you use the five second rule, you'll discover that you do too. Here's how you're gonna use the rule. The moment, the moment that you feel your thoughts drift, and have you ever noticed how worrying and self-doubt, they have a way of literally like taking you away from a situation. You can feel your mind go from the present moment to drifting to something negative. Maybe you're sitting at a meeting at work and uh, suddenly you start talking down at yourself and doubting yourself. It happens like that. But the moment that you catch yourself do it, that's a moment of tremendous power. You have a decision to make. You can either sit there and listen to the worry and listen to the self-doubt and let it hijack you, or you can make a decision to assert control. That's when you use the rule. You're gonna use the countdown trick, five, four, three, two, one. It's essential. Counting backwards interrupts the negative thought pattern. 
it's also going to awaken your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that you need to override a bad habit and replace your bad habit with a positive new one. So every time you feel your thoughts drift to something negative, or you find yourself worrying about things you can't control, five, four, three, two, one, it'll switch the gears in your brain, it'll interrupt the negative thought pattern, it'll activate your prefrontal cortex, and you've just created a starting ritual that will prime your mind to accept a more positive thought. That is how you use the rule to change. Some days you might use the rule 20 times to interrupt your habit of worrying and doubting yourself. When life suddenly changes and you feel like you have lost control and you start to feel stuck and powerless, how do you take control when you don't know where your life or the world or this moment is going? And here's the number one thing I want you to know. You don't need to know where this moment or where the world is going. You just need to know where you are going next. And one of the things that has happened, uh, certainly in the pandemic, but it always happens when there's any kind of reckoning in your life is that when you have something suddenly happen and your life is fundamentally changed, whether it's a death or somebody says, I don't love you anymore, or you're fired, or you find yourself uh, with a scary health diagnosis, there is a line in the sand. There is a life before that happened and then a life after that moment happened. And that line in the sand, that reckoning that happens, and it happens for all of us, whether it's happening for you right now or it has happened in the past, I'm telling you, there is a gift inside of this, even the darkest moments, because every single sudden change in your life that makes you feel like you've lost control and you no longer know where you're going, it's like hitting the giant pause button. And if you, lean into the moment, there is a chance for tremendous wisdom and growth. There are things that you can do right now in order to take control of where you're going, of what you're thinking about. And you can start to take this moment of change and you can use it to be able to take and make an intentional pivot in the direction that is meant for you next. And one of the things I wanna say about this moment is look, if you're losing loved ones, you are terrified, this has made you lose your job, you feel like you're in that moment where everything, you know, you're falling off a cliff, you're trying to pack a parachute, you're grieving. And so you gotta give yourself space to grieve the losses that you're feeling. And when you get a little bit of distance from the grieving and the ways of grief and fear that you're feeling start to space out. They don't ever leave you, but over time, those waves of, holy cow, and I don't want this, and I can't handle this, and why is this happening to me? Time will start to lessen those waves. You will gather your feet underneath you again, and you will absolutely be stronger and be a better version of yourself based on this incredible challenge that you're facing. And I can say that even though you may be facing in a tough time, because if you think about your life, you faced extraordinary challenges and there hasn't been a single one that hasn't made you a better and stronger version of yourself. And this moment will be no different. So I want you to understand that when you get out of the cycle of grief, this is an enormous reckoning, an enormous opportunity for you to hit the pause button and for you to start to ask yourself the question, what do I want my life to look like? Because I think too many of us are sitting here going, I can't wait for my life to get back to normal. I can't wait for this to end. I can't wait to things to go back to normal. And in any moment of reckoning, what happens is there's actually parts of your old life that you don't wanna go back to. And there is a tremendous amount that you're learning in this moment that you need to pause and take in and say, okay, based on what I've just learned, based on my old life, when I look ahead to my new life, what is it that I want my new life to look like? This next chapter, I can turn to a blank page, I can take all this wisdom, all this resilience, all this strength, and I can write something new.
That's what I want you to know. You don't need to know where the world or where everything is headed. You just need to know where you're going to head next. This is a great story about a bunch of topics. It's a story about confidence. It's a story about being comfortable in your own skin. It's a story about being yourself no matter where you are or what you're doing. And it's a story about the power of your unique self-expression. And your unique self-expression comes out and is amplified when you feel comfortable in your own skin. I got into the speaking business, gosh, six or seven years ago. I had a TEDx talk that went crazy viral. That's what started the speaking business. And when I first got into the speaking business, I was really intimidated because I was new to it. And I wanted to do a very good job and I wanted to fit in. So I looked around at what all the top people in the industry of uh, motivational speaking and speaking on the corporate circuit were doing. And I noticed that all the women uh, were dressed in heels, wearing pencil skirts or beautiful dresses, the kind of thing that you might see a news anchor wearing, like a nice dress, heels. So I just wore what everybody else was wearing. Didn't even occur to me to wear something else because here I am trying to break into a new industry. So I look at everybody at the top, I copy what they're doing, and I am not comfortable in high heels. Yes, if my husband Chris and I are going out on date night, I can rock them like the best of them. But walking through a convention center in them, standing on a stage for an hour in a pair of heels while you're trying to hold in your stomach because you're being broadcast on a big screen and you're wearing a, a dress, like it was the least comfortable outfit I could possibly wear, very self-conscious in it. I'm not that graceful in a pair of heels, so I sort of like poo, poo, poo on a stage, but that's what I did for the first couple of years. So I was in Miami, this must have been probably five years ago, I was in Miami, and I had just gotten off stage, take off the heels, take off the dress, put on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, I got like an hour to kill before I have to leave for the airport. I'm gonna to fly to Vegas because I've got a speech in Vegas the next morning. So I'm walking uh, down Collins Ave in South Beach in Miami. And I walk past this store. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. I loved this store. And there in the window were the most amazing high top sneakers I had ever seen in my entire life. I was like a moth to the flame. Let me show you these bad boys because these are the originals. This right here, notice the gold shimmery sparkle and the confident blaze orange. I didn't own anything like this. I'd never seen anything like this. I immediately thought, whoa, this, I bet is what like a Justin Bieber kind of wears. I mean, these are insanely cool. I went inside and they were pretty expensive. I'd never spent that kind of my, I wasn't a sneaker head yet. But I thought, hey, I, I, I spend that kind of money on a pair of nice heels, so why not treat myself to a pair of sneakers, okay? So I get back to the hotel, I pack up, I hop the flight, I get to Vegas. Now, I wake up the next morning and I have a tech check, which is where you rehearse the speech and go through like all the technology rehearsals before the event's starting. My tech check is at 7.30, the doors to the event open at 8, and I'm on stage at 8.30. And I had a red dress, my heels, or so I thought. So I crack open, that's what I was planning on wearing. I crack open the suitcase, there are no heels. I have left the heels in the hotel room back in Miami. All I have are the Birkenstocks that I wore on the plane and I wore out in Vegas last night and my new Justin Bieber high top sneakers. And I have exactly 15 minutes to get to the tech rehearsal and nothing else is open. So Birkenstocks, Justin Bieber, I think we'll go with the Justin Bieber sparkly high tops. I slapped those puppies on. I walked from my hotel room all the way through the casino floor, past all the restaurants and the shops to the convention center, which you know is like a two mile walk. I was so happy to be not only in my red dress, but more importantly, in my Justin Bieber sneakers because it was super comfortable to walk there that way. I get to the backstage area and for the first time in two years, something happened. And let me tell you what happened. One of the guys that was on the production crew turned and goes, ah, oh, cool sneakers. That was like the first time somebody in production had really acknowledged me for something other than the job in two years. So I was like, huh. And as I started walking toward the backstage area, everybody I passed, 
cool kicks. Oh, those are cool. Oh, those are cool. And I'm like, this is wild. Nobody's ever complimented on my, like, this is like, people are, and so I did the tech rehearsal and then this was the moment of truth. When I walked out onto that stage, it was at the MGM arena and uh, there were like 5,000 real estate agents in the audience. I was there to deliver a speech for Remax. It was the first time I'd ever walked on a stage where I actually felt like myself. It was also the first time that I felt the audience kind of lean forward and go, oh, she seems kind of cool. But when you walk onto a stage and heels in a dress, you're like the authority and you're on a stage and you're talking at people. There's something about walking onto a stage or walking through life and having something fun that you're wearing that makes you relatable and interesting and real. And from that moment forward, I have never not worn sparkly sneakers for work. I wore them every day on my daytime talk show. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I probably have 20 pairs of these. I love, this is my favorite, these are my favorite. Well, I love, these are my favorite because these are the originals, but I would say these are my second favorite because I like the low top, top and I love the blue. I love these, um, which have a big silver kind of thing. These are super comfortable. And I've got a bunch of these and these did not even come with sparkles. So I literally bought Swarovski crystals or whatever the hell they're called and got a glue gun out and put them on myself. If you're looking for sparkly sneakers, there's all kinds of them out there these days. It's the coolest thing in the world. The dazzled sneakers are a thing. Whether you go to DSW or Nordstrom's or Zappos or anywhere, you can find them. And so the moral of the story, the secret to confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. And the secret to being relatable and likable is being yourself and being comfortable in your own skin. And so whatever it is that gives you a little flair, whether it's a little pin on your jacket or a little flower in your pocket or sparkles on your sneakers or cool specs, you gotta like, you gotta, you gotta find the confidence to bring that to the way that you go through life because there's something unique about you. And when you settle into what is really an expression for you, you feel comfortable in your own skin. And that's the greatest feeling in the world. How do I rebuild my relationship with myself when starting from ground zero? So Mel, this is a, a pretty broad, expansive question. And so I thought maybe we would talk about this and then we would narrow down into specific what are we talking about. So starting from ground zero might mean, hey, I had a traumatic event happen to me, or maybe my life is changing. Maybe I'm reaching a point in my life where I need to do something different. I'm learning that everything I've done to make me happy or fulfilled or satisfied isn't working. So for Frederico, where do we even start? What, what do we talk about? Uh, it, it, you actually actually start the exact same place we all have to start mm. every morning in the mirror mm. every single morning in the mirror you see the most important relationship that you have in life is the one you have with yourself it yeah. is the foundation of every relationship that you have it's the foundation of how you experience life and what we are going to punch a hole through today is the fact that every single human being has a disgusting ugly self-destructive habit that mm. nobody is talking about mm. that is part of your morning routine. Yeah. And here's the habit. Frederico and everybody on the planet currently stands in front of the mirror as they brush their teeth. Hopefully you're brushing your teeth and wiping that gunk out of your mouth, mm -hmm. right? So we get rid of the dragon <laughs> breath. But <laughs> as you're doing that, you're doing one of two things. Every human being does this. You either beat the daylights out of yourself and you focus on all the stuff you need to fix the things you hate, the parts of yourself you can't stand. And that's the good news mm. because the majority of people are doing the other thing. This is sad. The majority of people cannot even look at themselves in the mirror mm. because they are disgusted or they are disappointed or they don't like how long they've let themselves go. And so every morning, Part of your morning routine right now, and this, is, this goes so down to the core of what's not working and what you can easily flip and change. 
Because if you stand in front of the mirror and you can't even look at yourself, that is a habit of self-rejection that gets repeated every single day. You are not even secure enough with yourself and accepting enough of yourself Mm. to look at the mirror and see, holy cow, because here's the other thing I want everyone to understand right now. We're going to explain the high five habit, but here's the first breakthrough. A, you're either, be honest with yourself, which do you do? Do you not look in the mirror or do you focus on the things that you need to fix? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I do look in the mirror and yeah, there's certain, I'm going through the day. I'm like thinking how I could have done things differently. What I need to do the next day. Yeah. I, so I, I do look in the mirror. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I tend to avoid looking in the mirror. Mm. Yeah. Why is that? You tell me. Yeah. I don't know. No, well, think about it. Why do you think you don't look in the mirror? I, I've never thought that it was a necessity uh, to to gaze upon myself to... I mean, I'm sure I glance. Uh, there's a picture of me in the mirror, but it's be- it becomes second nature in a way. Yes. And so I don't beat myself up so, so much. I mean, that's a, different, that's a different sort of story that we tell ourselves. But I've never thought about the power of looking in the mirror that, and how that might actually benefit me. Mm. Well... I want you to consider it's not a reflection. There are two human beings in the bathroom with you every morning. There's you. Uh huh. And my daughter, she's always. Yeah, so now there's four. <laughs> bothering me yeah. in the bathroom. Or the dog no. or whatever, yeah. Uh, or there's, so there's two human beings. Right. Mm. There's you and there's a human being in the mirror. Mm. And the human being in the mirror is really trying. Mm. And they are in need of your support and they are in need of your encouragement and they need you to wake up and to see them and they need you to stop beating them up and they need some encouragement Mm. and this is a really deep thing and it begins every morning by simply taking a moment and being with the human being in the mirror which i think represents your soul your spirit your potential for people that, you know, kind of like the inner child work and that stuff, it represents the person inside you that's still trying to heal. Mm. Mm. And if you begin your day every day by not looking in the mirror or by picking apart the things you don't like, 91% of women do not like how they look. Wow. 50% of people cannot look in the mirror. Mm. Yeah. And what you just said is, is exactly right. Most of us, it's so casual, spend that moment drifting into the day where we start to think about all the things we need to do or you know if you're like a lot of us you're already pile driving yourself going Mm -hmm. i got up too late and i got to answer that email and i didn't get this done and And then you catch yourself in the mirror Mm. and you then start oh my god i look like crap and i got to be on a zoom call in eight minutes Mm. and i haven't walked the dog yet and the pile driving begins and you guys know that once your attitude goes negative it's going to continue to take you down yeah And so first things first, we got to break the habit of Uh, self-rejection and we need to create a new habit of partnership, trust, encouragement, compassion, connection to self. Because if we can start to help you every morning to start your day with a little bit of partnership and compassion with yourself, if you can build the ability to like yourself, even if you're not where you want to be in life, it won't matter if other people don't like you because that can't change the fact that you like yourself. Yeah. And so this isn't about being a narcissistic asshole. <laughs> this is not about being a jerk. This is not about being selfish. This is not about being some cocky, overconfident. This is about compassion. This is about support. This is about your most fundamental, profound needs. Love people. Use things. That's your book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. None of us know how to love ourselves, and it begins every morning with this new habit I want you to create that I created during a terrible moment in my life called Mm. the high five habit. You also tend to get a lot of positive, uh, you know, emotion and praise when you're achieving those things. At least I did too, and I think that's why I chased it so much. I infused Mm. the doing with being lovable, the achieving with being worthy. And so as I walk into the bathroom that second morning and the sort of profound nature of what was unfolding started to hit me, I have this second epiphany as I'm brushing my teeth. And that is this. Every morning, there are two people in the bathroom. There's you and there's a human being in the mirror who needs you. They're trying so hard. 
They are waiting for you to wake up and to realize that they're there. They need your encouragement. They need your support. They need your love. They are so tired of you picking them apart and thinking about all the things that are going wrong. And as I put my toothbrush down, I remembered the fact that yesterday, the day before, I had been researching, how do I need to change right now? Because I have all these people on my team. How am I going to show up for my family? And I found this piece of research from Harvard that says that if you take just a less than a minute of intentional reflection about how you're going to show up for the people that you're leading, and this could apply to your family, anybody, it changes your focus, your productivity, it changes your mood, it changes how you show up, your ability to impact. And for whatever reason, in that moment, it all fused together. And I thought, well, what if I do that for me? And I asked myself a question I had never asked myself before. And it was this. Who do you need me to be today? Like I asked the woman in the mirror, who do you need me to be today? How can I show up for you? And, you know, what kind of popped in my mind that morning was like, well, it'd be nice if you were kinder to me because I'm trying really hard. <laughs> and then the next one was, it'd be great if you could muster up some optimism here. Have <laughs> fun today. Like, you know, it's like, oh, throw me a lifeline, Mel. And as I thought about it, I then went and I raised my hand and I sealed it with this high five. And something like it just felt like this fusion with the person in the mirror. And that's when I really got it. I got that this is so much deeper and more profound because what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm fulfilling my fundamental emotional needs. I'm seeing myself. I am meeting myself where I am. I am affirming my unique need and I am celebrating myself exactly where I am right now, whether it's challenging, whether it's exhilarating. I am with myself right in that moment in a way that I don't know if I had ever been. I think it's really you know, pivotal. And I want, you know, I want to reiterate this because I think it's such a great point of understanding back to that onion analogy. Again, when you said there's two people, right. And I could go as far to say that so many of us have different masks, different selves, right. The core, like we were just talking about is who we really are. Mm -hmm. So, so many times in our day to day, we are showing up in all of these different ways, playing all of these different roles. And there is an us that we need to, and the journey becomes about connecting back to. So a lot of us are kind of at odds with even ourselves in so many moments because we're so practiced at, sh at showing up in all of these other ways that we've lost so much sight of the authentic core within each of us. And what you're also illustrating, I think that's so important, is the daily, the practice of that reconnection, right? And many of us start by not knowing, not seeing ourselves, not knowing what there is even to see or to self-express. For me, I share this story often. I had a really, when I came to the awareness that I, like you and like many of us, filter the whole world through everyone else and what their needs may be. I had a big gaping hole of knowledge. I didn't know myself. I didn't really know that person in the mirror. I did know that we do, I believe, as humans universally. I don't care where you're signing onto this live right now around the globe. We have at our core the desire to be seen, to be heard, to be just in full self-expression and that, for that to be enough. Yet I didn't know who that person was. So I, I share this because I do want to speak to the people who, as we begin to look in the mirror, and for a lot of us, it might just be a concept. Okay, there's an authentic self in there where I don't know where that person is. I don't know what that person needs yet. And that's when we begin the journey to explore. Because I, like many of us, didn't know at first, was profoundly uncomfortable with even beginning to ask those questions. What do I need right now? Can I just be enough in this moment? And it is the question that sets us off into the journey. And I share that because I know a lot of us, we want to know the answers or we think we should. And then we shame ourselves out of even taking the journey into exploring those. But for me, I'll share, that's how my journey began, not knowing at all with incredible discomfort, even around stopping to even ask myself those questions. 
And of course, like you said, it does not happen overnight. I say there's no light switch here. Oh, I heal now. Um, and again, I want to <laughs> highlight the practice of it, right? Because there's concepts, there's books, there's, you know, people and teachers and tools and techniques, and they're all in theory until, like I say, we bridge the gap from theory into action. And that's what I've always resonated so much with your work um, from the five second, five second, well, this idea of the tool. How do right. I practically apply right. this? And now, of course, the high five habit. How do I turn this idea into a daily action that can actually help me create the change that I'm looking for to a reconnect with that person beneath and B to over time, grow to love them over time, grow to love them. Why has it been tough? You really love her. You're getting on a plane and you're going to go see her. Yeah. I love her a bunch. Okay. So I guess I'm kind of coming to the realization that I haven't been hearing her properly connecting with her on the level that I should be. And now trying to figure that out. Yeah. So a couple months ago, she had, we, we've been having counseling. And, That's good. Uh, mm -hmm. My husband and, and I go to counseling. Help. It helps. She was doing it before, and then it kind of became the group, and then now yeah. I kind of see a little bit on my own. So yeah. I've been recognizing these things, but I also know like a couple of months ago in counseling, she admitted on her last tour that she had emotionally connected with somebody else. So mm -hmm. obviously that put a big fire under my ass. Yeah. And, uh, supposedly it's scary. I, supposedly I handled it really well, so she's wanting to, you know, do all this. She's worked a lot on herself for uh, kind of getting to the point where she's at. Yeah. She's got a spot on the bookshelf that's 12, 15 composition books deep of just thoughts ever since she was back, I think she said, to like 12. Amazing. So because of some things that happened to her before that age of yeah. being at Take Me Here. So she's had to do a lot of that. This is certainly as a final boarding class. We're going to start closing in about three minutes. And they will not doing this, you, you realize how much you need to work on yourself. It's scary. It's scary. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of regrets mm -hmm. come up. And a lot of things you wish yeah. you could do over. And then you start to realize your shit from your past that really messed with you, that you shoved down, yeah. that happened when you were a kid. This is, I think, the cycle that we all hit mm -hmm. in adulthood. Mm -hmm. And here's the amazing opportunity. You not only have an amazing opportunity to change the person that you are and to change the relationship that you have with your life, but you have an amazing opportunity to change the relationship you have with yourself. Because your thoughts, your feelings, they actually matter too. And you can't get... I've been neglecting. Yes. See, relationships are amplifiers. You go into a relationship and you're not right with yourself, that relationship just magnifies what's missing. What did you just get from that? I like that. Well, it's going to expose those demons more. Yeah. And here's the thing that most men, at least in a traditional gender sense, don't understand. That it takes tremendous strength to be vulnerable. It takes tremendous strength to talk about the shit that's bothering you. Yeah. It takes tremendous strength to admit that you're wrong and to be scared. And that's actually what makes you connect more deeply to your partner. My husband of 25 years failed miserably in the restaurant business. Nearly bankrupt us. Lost it all. When he left the business, he was an alcoholic. And completely lost and demoralized and um, I did not know until recently because it was through these rock bottom moments that my career took off I invented this little thing called the five second rule that I used to get out of bed when the anxiety was so crushing the only thing that would help me escape it was drinking myself into oblivion gotcha. to numb it all out and um, I started using this little brain hack to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, shut down the noise in my brain and launch myself forward through the fear, through the pain, through all of it. And my whole life turned around. Chris's life turned around. But I did not know until recently 
when we've been in couples therapy that the man has for the last eight years just been beating the hell out of himself because he feels like he failed. He feels like he wasn't there for me. He feels like he didn't do his job providing. Yeah. And then when your spouse starts to get successful and they start to find themselves if it's very frustrating. What I want to tell you is that the opportunity to connect with her is through being open and through being like go toward that shit. I'm proud of you. I've been doing it. I can see that. I can see that. I can see that. And you got to learn how to love yourself regardless of what happened. Regardless Regardless of what you did or didn't do, regardless of all that, you got to learn how to look in the mirror and see a man who is worth rooting for and who is worthy of love. It is not too late to change this. It is not too late to change your life. It's not too late to change your marriage. But it's an inside-out job. You start to show yourself some kindness and some love. And you start sharing more of the stuff that's coming up for you. And that is the path that's going to actually heal you, and it's going to stop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Just need my mojo back. I think that's what she mad at me. I had a nice swagger and everything, but it's uh, gotten diluted or by life. I think so. Maybe my own just being stagnant. And that's it. Accepting instead of keep pushing. You know, my good friend. Joel Marin, who you should follow, just sent me a freaking thing that he wrote today. Oh my God, Joel! Praise you, Joel. Joel, I cannot believe this. Joel Marin, I'll give you his name. He literally wrote me this whole thing that he wrote today that you need to hear. Wait till I'm gonna find out. Uh, M-A-R-I-O-N. He wrote me this whole thing about the fact that when we are born, we have incredible potential, but so few of us realize what we're capable of. And he uses this analogy. This is in your DNA. You were created to be a Lamborghini in life. You have literally everything inside you to be able to perform like that Lambo. You're manufactured that way. That engine, 729 horsepower engine is in there. That insane torque. You have unbelievable intrinsic ability to go from zero to 65 miles per hour in under three seconds. But for most of us, we never experience close to those numbers that we are created to perform at. And so he tells a story about how he was test driving one, but the neighborhood he's in has like 35 mile per hour speed. Okay. He ended up not buying it because he never experienced the potential. Right. What you're talking about is you're talking about the fact that you actually know there is that inside of you. And when you lose your your capacity that you are built in, and you stop growing, and you stop stretching yourself, and you stop pushing yourself forward, and learning new stuff, and expressing yourself, something inside you starts to feel like it's dying. And so I'm telling you, yes, it's still there. And the reason why it's still there is because you miss it. And you can only miss something you know. Okay. So I think Joel sent me that for a reason. In times in my life when I've felt lost or stagnant, I say I feel like a racehorse tied to a pony ride at a kid's birthday party. Like I am built to fucking run. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I hate it when I feel like just tied down like that. Yeah. And so there is something inside you that you've been holding back. What do you think it is? Not really sure. Well, I'm I would take sure on a challenge. A, not sure if it's a passion that I've ever tapped into or something that I've missed since, you know, earlier years. Who knows? I think you should take on a challenge. I think you should take on climbing some mountain or some kind of race or mm-hmm. some, like, fitness thing. Something that's a little out of your comfort zone to give you something to push you. It doesn't have to be the perfect thing. Just something that you're up to is enough. Yeah, yeah. 
But I want to acknowledge you for the fact that you recognize that there's an issue and you're taking the steps to go make the effort. You're getting on a plane, you're flying to surprise your wife. Not only that, but I deal with motion sickness, vertigo, and, awesome. <laughs> and I don't drive well at night, so I'm about, I've got the band, the bands on. Great, they work. I took my motion sickness pills. I love that. I give you a high so, five for that. That's we're, fantastic. Uh, we're doing what we can. You're and doing she, it. <laughs> then does she know you, she doesn't know you're coming. She does now. Oh, good. She did not a couple days ago, but then she was, we were trying to do the, uh, pregnancy reveal to some of the family because we just found out last week. Congratulations! So she was all like, oh, no, I'm going to do it. You're there. I'm here. And I want to video chat my family and be able to like tell them because she's up where some of the family is and she was seeing someone come to visit. So I told her, I'll tell you what, well, I'm actually coming up there. So she was pretty surprised, but you know. That's um, awesome. You're going to be an awesome dad. <laughs> you want to know who the best dads are? Yeah. The ones who are actually right with themselves. Mm, that's true. The ones who are able to talk about their emotions. This the ones who are second. able to be human. This is my second child. Like, I this is her first, but I told them, like, my son's uh, almost 23. That's amazing. So, to start over, it's like, uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a lot of emotions. You're not going to start over. You actually are building a pod. Okay. Okay. And my son's been great. He's, he's, the guys would be super impressed with how good my son is. He hasn't seen his mom since he was six years old. So I kind of raised him. I mean, there's people in and out of the life, but you know, but yeah. You got, you got a moment in your life to make yourself really proud of yourself. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, if I were a betting woman, some days I am. Depends how much liver I have. I'd place my bet on it. Uh, that's what I'd like. I want that more than anything. Don't am wish I, for it. Don't want it. And my wife deserves it. Do the work. No, no, no. Okay. hold on. What? Go ahead. You deserve it. I deserve it. Okay. Give yourself what you're seeking from other people. Seek redemption and forgiveness because you deserve it from yourself. And in my book, forgiveness means that you have stopped wishing things could be different. Accept everything that's happened or didn't happen as a lesson. And as long as you hold on to that shit from the past, you're actually still there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What'd you get out of this? Um, I got a little more resiliency, a little pick me up. And um, I'm glad I came and talked to you very much and took the time. I wasn't sure if I was imposing because I didn't know if it was more like a, a female thing. Or, but uh, I have plenty of emotion that I'm pretty open with. Sometimes too open, maybe. I don't, know, I don't think so. I'm also going to introduce you to my husband. <laughs> so he created a men's group called, or a men's retreat called Soul Degree, where he takes guys out into the woods for five days mm -hmm. to actually have these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. And he's had guys from 22 to 60 plus, multiple tours of duty, professional athletes, regular, just everyday folks like all of us. And it's remarkable. And what he also does, because he only does these a couple times a year, is he um, also has uh, calls every month where uh, it's guys get on and he leads a meditation and then there's a topic that y'all discuss and it's really freaking cool. And okay. so I will make sure that you have his information and I will get both of your email addresses and I will have my team email you a credit so you can listen to one of my books on Audible. That's what's cool. I've been doing a lot more trying to listen to stuff. And, you know, you just don't know what direction to go because some stuff, it's just some people just want to make some money on you and... You, just, you know, there's so much out there. You just want to find the right path yeah. as best as possible. Yeah. So, awesome. thank you. You deeply impacted me today. Okay, um, what happened? Well, the boundaries thing. Mm. And I loved that. Um, I feel like I don't have very good boundaries. But then I heard you just say that you were a victim of sexual abuse, which I also am. And I think that part that you were saying to put your hand on your chest. I think my leg is nervous broken because it made me more anxious. <laughs> it's not broken. Push harder and repeat it over and over and over and over and over again and you will slowly feel yourself come back into your body. So when you have an anxiety response, do you leave your body or what happens to you? Um, I shut down. Okay. Um, 
bed and bed covers. Like I don't want to do things. Or sometimes I go over the top uh -huh. and exhaust myself. Okay. So what I want you to try, because I don't actually want you to stay in bed. I think staying in bed is a terrible thing to do. And here's why. Um, when you stay in bed, and are you talking about in the morning, like you wake up and just want to stay in bed? Mm -hmm. So there's a reason why we feel waves of anxiety and stress in the morning. Number one, when you wake up, your cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone, are typically pretty high. Mm -hmm. And so that triggers a kind of dump in terms of your emotional state. The second thing is, is that um, if you are waking up and you're not excited about your life or there's chaos going on, you're going to feel this sense of anticipatory dread. So lying there makes the dread feel worse. Third thing, staring at the ceiling, thinking about your problems, does not solve them. Fourth thing, <laughs> rolling over and trying to go back to sleep does not change what feels like a nightmare in your life, right? And so what will change it is if you throw off the sheets, put your feet in the ground, and get up. Because once you get up, you can get going. And once you get going, you can keep going. What I want you to add to this, though, is the high five in the mirror and the high five to your heart. Because before you start your day in a state where you're spiraling, I want you to come back into your body and tell yourself over and over and over again, I'm OK, I'm safe, I'm loved. OK? If you can hear it, it's true. Why do you think when we did that exercise in the audience, you felt a wave of anxiety come? Because I don't, don't believe it's true. <laughs> OK. That's exactly why you felt that. You felt that because you've been running so fast and so long because you think as long as you're busy and you're running, nobody can catch you and hurt you. And so slowing down is terrifying. OK, I had the exact same thing. In fact, it wasn't until this fucking pandemic <laughs> that I couldn't go out that I really realized that I run to Target and Starbucks and go fill up the car because I'm not I wasn't OK being in my body and being still. I was so busy because if I was busy, then I wasn't having to feel the shit I hadn't healed yet. <laughs> and so when you put your hand on your heart and you started breathing and going, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved, your body was like, oh, no, you aren't. We are running. We are going to Target. We got shit to do. We are not listening to this lady. And, <laughs> and your body will fight it because you have trained yourself to run and move and be busy as a protection mechanism. Yeah. And what I'm here to tell you is you are okay. You are safe. And you are loved. And you can Heal this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I I'll want to believe it eventually, you know. Okay. I'll believe it eventually. Right now, I want you to say it. Say it. Okay, go ahead. Put your hands on your heart. Let's uh, see you do it. You can keep taping. Okay. Smart Thank cookie. Because I will And I will put a little alarm in your phone. So go ahead. Put your hands on your heart. Here we go. Close your eyes. Press deeper. Press deeper. Okay, now you say it for yourself. I have the one I'm, I'm struggling. Yes, you can. That's okay. Breathe in. Here we go. Breathe in. Blow it out. <sighs> Say it. I'm safe. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm loved. Breathe in again. That's great. I'll say it again. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm loved. Let's do it again. Breathe in. That's great. Really great deep breath. Blow it out. Say it again. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm loved. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's super weird. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel? I feel it a little more. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Because there are moments when, um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going around mm -hmm. you. And what you need to know is that no matter what's going around you, you always have you. And you can bring yourself back into your body. You can bring yourself back home. You can settle yourself in this moment. And if you can tune out the noise and come right back in here and feel yourself literally flip the switch and find some power then you can take a deep breath and face whatever's coming. You don't have to run anymore. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm talking to myself too. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much. So inspiring. You're so I inspiring. I want to be like you one day. <laughs> you are like me one day. You're running from your fears. You're anxious. You're doing your best. You're reminding yourself every day. You get triggered by shit. This is what my life looks like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just because I uh, am creating these tools doesn't mean I'm not using them every day. Yeah. 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 Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.